Investing panel. I'm just going to do, give a few introductory remarks, talk a little bit about what the Climate Reality Project is, why we developed the Cyan Pro Cell program, and then give you a little bit of introduction to our moderator and native speakers. And then I'll turn it over and we'll run the panel. Uh, the Climate Reality Project was founded by uh, former Vice President Al Gore. We work to build support at all levels of society, in all sectors of society, in many countries around the world for addressing climate change. And we do that in a couple of ways. One is we run various kinds of on-the-ground campaigns that are really based on two things. One is we now have branch offices in 10 countries. But even more importantly, we train what we call climate reality leaders, um, who we train in three-day sessions to talk about uh, the talk about climate change. Last year, our climate reality leaders gave 2,900 speeches, uh, reaching a gigantic audience. Um, we train uh, also what we call climate speakers in four-hour sessions, designed to train people to speak to their peers, farmers to farmers, businessmen to businessmen. Um, last year, again, we started, we did about a session every week and a half around the U.S. Uh, in, different, in different interest groups. We did nine in the African-American community, seven in the faith-based community, five in the Latino community, and so on. So mm -hmm. we really need to reach out uh, to a lot of people that way. So we start by having a very strong on-the-ground presence in a lot of places. We supplement that with a major media ability. We've got a very big media group. We do, I think, very good media uh, films and, uh, um, and other productions. We have a program each year we call 24 Hours of Reality, uh, which reaches tens of millions of people. Um, around the world, um, and so we try and reach out with as many to as many people as we can. And of course, we have Al Gore as our leading spokesperson and a person who really tirelessly travels around the world, uh, working on this and trying to uh, convince people to address this issue. And been doing that uh, for a couple uh, of decades. So the question really is, um, when we look at this, what's the best way to influence people? to try and get them, particularly in a place like the United States, where the country is very, very bitterly divided on issues like this. And it's very hard for a liberal to speak to a conservative and for me to speak from the Northeast to speak to a farmer. What do we do to try and break through that? And what we're trying to do are a lot of these peer-to-peer -peer programs. One is the training I said where we train people to speak to their peers. But this I Am Pro Snow campaign is really part of that. It's an effort to reach out, in this case, to a gigantic community that should be and is very concerned about the results of climate change. And then the key is to get people to pay attention, it doesn't take a huge amount to this issue, to understand why they should make it important and therefore to make it an issue. Even outside the United States where countries are not as bitterly divided as they are in the United States on this issue, we're still asking people to bring about change, to change the way they're doing things. And that still requires work and support um, and it's, again, uh, I think it's very, very well done in the way we are trying, we are trying to do it. Uh, so if you look at this and why we, the, the question is, why did we pick the winter sports section? One, of course, is that it's a very, very large community. It involves business people, uh, regular people, athletes. I mean, very, very interesting and influential and important communities. But also because climate change is happening now and it's beginning to affect the winter sports community very, very appreciative. Winters are getting shorter and mountain snowpack is declining around the world. In Europe, in Europe apparently, in the Swiss Alps, have seen a 15 to 25 percent decrease in winter snow in the last 70 years. Now, ski resorts can make up for that to some degree. They can, they can make snow. That becomes more and more expensive as they do it. It becomes more and more difficult. We don't want to get them to the point where they're suddenly at a, at a, at a point where they can no longer cope with this and where it becomes very, very difficult for people to do it, and also where it becomes much more expensive to run that and to run it for everybody. <coughs> so we're trying to address climate change before that happens. So if we don't address it, we have a significant economic impact on the communities. Um, we will see less snow cover, and of course, less snow cover has, has other impacts besides just tourism and skiing. It affects water supply in the communities around them. Uh, people are very, very dependent around the world on melting snow from mountains. And so again, it's a very, very important issue to all of us. So we began this effort in the I Am Pro Snow by working with <coughs> uh, a person named, a group named Warren Miller Entertainment. Uh, we started this about three years ago. It was first the United States. We're now beginning to expand it um, around the world. And we now have a vast array of partners. 
in the winter sports community, including our participants today, um, groups like NASTAR, Icelandic skis, Cool Planet skiers, Olympic superstar Ted Lighty, and a vast array of amazing I Am Pro Snow ambassadors. Now we've taken that, and we've also obviously brought this to Paris, uh, to these climate negotiations. That's why we're having uh, the meeting today. And one thing we did with this is we uh, developed a letter uh, to world leaders, uh, asked them to take action to save our winters and to save our snow communities. Uh, we have about 1,500 signatures from individuals, global businesses and governments around the world. The governments represent about almost 200,000 people. Uh, people are doing very interesting things. We have lots of businesses involved. Uh, Patagonia, Rossignol here today. Um, uh, we have the city of Park, U city of Utah, uh, which has done, um, I think has gone uh, uh, 100, going 100% renewable. We have Aspen here also uh, on the panel. So we really have a, a very, very broad array of, array of people and we're presenting that information to world leaders as part of this, again, to show with many, many other things that civil society is doing, to show world leaders that we want action. We had a big climate march canceled uh, on November 29th, in which we could have demonstrated that here. Now we'll have to do it without that march through things like we're like we're doing today and for action. And there are enough people here to do that. I mean, there are tens of thousands, literally, of people here from the civil society representing many groups. And this is just one part of that of that effort. Um, and again, this is an effort that we think is really. I just want to make one point. We talk a lot about the urgency of addressing this. We also talk about solutions. We think there are solutions to this climate crisis. And in fact, we think either now or we'll very soon at a point where renewable energy starts replacing very, very effectively fossil fuel-based energy. We think we'll be able to say some places now, some places in the near future, that if you convert to renewable energy, you will have cheaper, cleaner, and more reliable energy that will benefit the economy create jobs, and make a country more competitive. When that happens, when rural energy becomes cost competitive, everything starts to change in this. We think that's happening. We think that's why we're getting so much support from various parts of the business community now. So we can all go into this fight really confident that we have the economic basis to win this fight. And we can go into these negotiations confident that we can say to world leaders, you can make a commitment this year on climate change. Two years from now, when you look at it, you'll be able to make a stronger commitment. Four years, you'll be able to even make a stronger commitment. And that's part of, of all the environmental communities negotiating strategy to try and set up a mechanism where we can strengthen this effort as we go forward. So we, so we have here today a terrific panel. Our panelists include Elizabeth Burakowski, the uh, postdoctoral researcher at the University of New Hampshire mm -hmm. and a visiting scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Administration. Uh, we have Bruno Cirkley, the CEO at Rosignol. Uh, we have Michael Brune, the executive director of the Sierra Club. And we have Seth Westcott, a two-time Olympic gold medal uh, snowboarder and another superstar. <laughs> and we've got uh, Steve Skadron, the mayor of Aspen, Colorado. Um, our panel will be led today, will be moderated by Peter Fox. Uh, Peter's got a fantastic resume. I don't have time to read it all. Uh, he, is, um, uh, he was born in New York, raised in Maine. He graduated from the New School with an MFA in fiction in 2004. He's written for many, many magazines and papers, uh, including the New York Times Magazine. I won't go through all of them. He's founder editor of, of Nowhere Online, a traveling magazine which features a wide variety of articles um, uh, on, on uh, various natural history topics and travel topics. He's been nominated for two Pushcart Prizes and was a finalist for the 2009 Paul Olin Butler Fiction Prize. He won a Western Press Association Maggie the best series of articles in 2014. In 2013, he published Deep, The Story of Skiing and the Future of Snow. The book was featured on the cover of the New York Times Sunday Review, CBS, National News, NPR, and in both the United States Senate and House of Representatives. He's currently the editor of a very important influential magazine, Powder Magazine, and with that, let me turn this over to um, Peter. Uh, thanks very much um, to the Climate Reality Project, I Am Pro Snow, Snow Riders International, the World Climate Summit for, uh, for making this happen. Uh, this is a, a subject that is incredibly important to everybody up here on the panel right now. 
uh, not just from a, a political standpoint, but from actually uh, the place that we live, which is uh, in the mountains and where we spent most of our lives. Um, I was very lucky to um, be able to ski uh, and travel through mountains uh, around the world um, and uh, to, to witness mountain communities from uh, Peru and Bolivia to uh, the High Atlas Mountains in Morocco to Alaska, California, um, the European Alps, Japan. Uh, I noticed two things when when I was kind of moving around through these places, writing about them, skiing in their mountains, spending a lot of time in the communities at the, at the foot of the mountains. Um, there was this brotherhood among people that, that lived at altitude, that um, a sort of common understanding it was very easy to talk to these people. I would tell them stories about my life, they'd tell me stories about their life. Most of the stories involved uh, enduring incredibly long winters. Um, they involved uh, kind of living almost on this frontier. If you look where population slows down or density kind of lightens up, it's when you're starting to get up into the mountains. And uh, there's a common bond there. Uh, the other thing I noticed, and this was more recently, was disappearing snow. Uh, the routes that we were climbing in, in, in uh, Peru and Bolivia uh, were completely different than they were 30 years before. Uh, the guides that we were with had us rope up over glaciers that you used to be able to just march across, but because they were receding so quickly, they were breaking up. When we would go down into the, the little communities at the, at the base of these mountains, they would tell us stories about already their water supply was drying up, their fields were drying up, it was hard to uh, feed their livestock and whatnot, and they were wondering what's going on. So we're here today to talk uh, about what's going on and um, what are some of the things that this group of, of uh, kind of mountain community folks all around the world can come together, speak with one voice, and, uh, and, and try to create change, uh, try to push for national policy shifts in how we uh, create and consume energy, uh, climate change legislation and mitigation on a national and international scale. Um, this is something that the ski community is very interestingly uh, poised to do. It's, it's uh, an incredibly influential and typically quite affluent demographic. These are people living in Telluride, in Crested Butte, in Jackson Hole, uh, and their equivalents in, in the European Alps. Um, these are people that can make change, and they're on our slopes every day. Uh, some of us have taught them how to ski. Some of us have uh, pulled them out of places that they shouldn't be on the hill. And uh, oh, go ahead. And um, those are those are some of the folks that we're that we're trying to uh, to access, along with um, making mountain communities uh, an example, a a futuristic example of, of how a community can be run, um, which is a big part of I am Pro Snow's um, upcoming 100% renewable uh, initiative, which will challenge all mountain communities to be. Um, to become 100% uh, uh, use 100% renewable energy. So with that, um, I am going to ask uh, our panelists here uh, uh, the first question, and also to have them introduce themselves as to why exactly they're here today um, and their credentials and their kind of purpose at, at being at COP21. And along with that, I'd like to ask you what uh, what was the moment in your life when you realized that you were going to spend a, a lot of the rest of your life in the mountains. Uh, we'll start right here with Bruno from Rossignol. Good afternoon, Bruno Sinclair. I'm the CEO of uh, Rossignol. Uh, we, are just, we are just making skis now for 108 years. So, <laughs> so born in 1907. Um, so we do skis. We do all kind of equipment to, to, to do in the mountains, to go in the mountains. Uh, clearly, it's a, it's a big, big topic for us. Huh? Uh, you know, at this moment, at this very moment of the season, we are missing snow in the east of the U.S., huh? which is about 60% uh, of the U.S. business huh? in, ten number of, in terms of ski days, huh? or 20% uh, of the worldwide business. So, I mean, this is this is not a small thing. We are all. Uh, praying at this time of the year for snow because it's going to affect people, it's going to affect jobs of people uh, during the season and uh, we are all hoping for, for, for beautiful snow landscapes. I mean, so. um, uh, thank, thanks, I'm Steve Skadden, I'm the mayor of Aspen, Colorado. 
Bruno, I want to tell you first, I apologize. I'm skiing currently on a pair of Atomics. That's okay. <laughs> it's good to assess competition. <laughs> Aspen has been progressive around uh, climate change issues. And as a local government, we take steps to address the impact that our local community and the government itself has on the environment. Um, and we're proud of many things. Foremost is the fact that we are 100% renewable energy in our electric utility. That was, that was a 10-year project, and we achieved it this past June, and we are, the, I believe, the second city in the United States to achieve that. Uh, technically the third, um, but the second, a small town in Kansas, and I give them credit, uh, rebuilt after a hurricane, that's good for them, but there are 700 people. Uh, and credit to Burlington, Vermont, also was the first city in the country. Um, Porter, what's my next, uh, what do you, you might, might, you might measure measure Aha moment. moment in the mountains. Colorado has 54 peaks above 14,000 feet, which is, what, 4,500 meters or so. Uh, I ski them in the winter, and I run them in the summer. Wow. And uh, I remember being on top of one of them and glissading down to kind of stand under feet and slide, and I thought, I have to do this forever. So <laughs> that was my moment. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Barakowski. I have a master's in earth science from the University of New Hampshire and a PhD in earth and environmental science. And I currently am a visiting scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. I study snow, I study climate, and I also study the intersection of climate with industry. And so I've been reporting on what the effect of warmer winters is on the ski industry. And it's big. We lose about 15% of our skier visits when we have a warm, slushy year compared to cold, snowy years. My aha moment came because of one of those slushy years. I was in 2002 in New Hampshire, and I found that I could not get to the mountain soon enough, and I could not get there as many times as I wanted to. And from that moment on, I decided that I wanted to fight this, and I wanted to save our snow. Uh, my name is Seth Westcott. I grew up in the state of Maine, and um, when I was 10 years old, my aha moment was seeing my first James Bond film. <laughs> there was an opening segment uh, in which Tom Sims snowboarded, and I had been a skateboarder as a young kid, and uh, seeing that for the first time, I'd been on Nordic skis from the time that I was a really little kid, and alpine skiing already, and uh, but the crossover of snowboarding, well, that was kind of my moment of like, okay, I want to do that. and. Uh, it led me uh, into competition and sponsorship and stuff like that numerous years later. Uh, I'm currently the oldest member of the U.S. snowboard team. Um, I've been with the team 17 years now and on tour 20 years, uh, winning gold in both the 2006 and 2010 Olympics. Um, um, but my, my experience with the sport was growing up um, prior to becoming specialized in a discipline and everyone kind of had a real passion for winter. Um, it was, you know, we've seen athletes on my team come in um, where, you know, they kind of have the helicopter parents and stuff and they're forced into specializing at a really young age. And I think with my generation, um, we had some heroes that were early in the sport. And one of the big things that uh, was huge and paramount for me was that they traveled the world and wanted to go to far off places. And so for me, um, the cool thing about having the success in the sport has been that I've been able to go to places like Antarctica, um, spend 12 years in a row in Alaska. Uh, I was up in the Norwegian island of Svalbard last spring and, and seeing, um, seeing these far off parts of the world um, that are very different than going to ski areas and seeing the real impact um, of what's happening uh, with glaciers and when you see glaciers year after year. Um, we're actually, I've been training this last 10, year, 10 days uh, at the Pitztal Glacier in Austria, which is the highest glacier in that country. Um, they are equipped with massive rolls of this white reflective um, material that they cover the glacier with every year. We were there last year. There's been dramatic re uh, recession in just one year um, since we were there training. Uh, we have a World Cup in Austria next week. As of last night, uh, we just found out the World Cup the following week in Italy was canceled because there's no snow there. Um, so as an athlete, when you're relying on 
snow um, and winter sports to make your living. Uh, it's a direct impact on us. And, and for me really to have seen changes globally um, in 20 years of being on tour and going to these type of venues, um, it's, a, it's a real problem and we, it needs to be addressed. All right, uh, well first, thanks everybody for coming to the panel. I'm Mike Brun, I run the Sierra Club. And I hail from the mountain community of Alameda, California, which uh, <laughs> has an elevation of about four feet, I think. So that was last week. This week is that's three. Two feet, right? So either I'm here because uh, I'm on the wrong panel, um, or I'm here because I represent the Sierra Club. The Sierra Club was founded in the mountains, uh, uh, or really to protect Yosemite and the whole crest of the Sierras, and. What we have realized as an organization, we're the oldest environmental group in the world, uh, around for 123 years. Most of the first century was to protect places, deserts, mountains, wetlands, um, every beautiful and ecologically important place in the country that we could uh, get protected, we fought for it. And the Sierra Club realized after about 100, 110 years that almost all the places that we have been working to protect were now threatened because of climate change. And so we've shifted the organization to focus, uh, not exclusively, but predominantly on this. My aha moment, uh, I grew up on the Jersey Shore, so my aha moment in nature uh, wasn't in the mountains, but it was in the ocean, uh, where I realized that people can make a huge difference. Growing up in New Jersey, uh, on the shore, there was horrific water pollution, uh, and so just like some of us here are not able to experience the joy of being outdoors or being able to compete outdoors because of what's happening because of climate change. I was not able to go surfing, couldn't spend summers in the ocean for weeks, months at a time because you'd come out and you'd be sick because the pollution was so severe. And I saw how literally a couple individuals, a couple folks who didn't, weren't paid to do this work, but they just thought it was outrageous, took action. Uh, worked to get a chemical company to change their operations, worked to get a, a couple bills passed in New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. And within a few years, you could see your feet when you went in the ocean, the, the beaches were clear, beaches were open. And I saw how people can make a really powerful difference in their own lives and the lives of everybody else. So uh, that changed my life. Mm. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, I'm going to ask a, a question of Bruno and Steve. Um, 14 of the warmest years on record have happened in the last 15 years. Uh, the Alps have lost half of their glacial ice uh, in the last 150 years, uh, much of that since the 1980s. Um, back in America, the, the Sierra Nevada and the Cascades are forecast to uh, have a snowpack, spring snowpack reduction of 40 to 70 percent by the end of uh, the century. Um, there's a study out that says half the resorts in New, Eng New England are likely going to close, and that's in the next 30 years uh, due to lack of snow reliability. Um, it's a very serious topic to the ski industry itself. Um, and I, my question is, what um, exactly in your businesses, Bruno and Steve and, and the Aspen and Rosignol, um, have you? how is it affecting you, and how is it affecting business right now? Okay, of course, for us, it has a massive, uh, a massive impact. Uh, uh, I would say that there are three really um, kind of things. You have a low, low elevation results where this is a really serious issue. You have higher results where people can cope with that. Because, for example, I, I, I was talking uh, just two minutes ago in Chamonix, for example. In Chamonix, it's, um, weather is a big issue, warming is a big issue. When you see the glacier in Chamonix, uh, the Mer de Glace, uh, which is, sh which is uh, shrinking by five meters, the thickness is going down by five meters every year. Five meters. So this is absolutely incredible. Over the last 200 years, it was 0.7 meters uh, in average. So uh, it's affecting Chamonix, but everybody knows that whatever the, the, the weather is, you will have always snow in Chamonix. So in fact, Chamonix, they don't care much. If there is no snow in Europe, they know that the, the resort is going to be absolutely busy uh, because a lot of people are coming here. Uh, 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 so the, the real issue is, is for smaller, uh, uh, lower elevation resorts. And also for 
cross-country skiing because cross-country skiing is just you have snow you can ski you have no snow you can't ski if you have no ski in scandinavia uh, which was about the case uh, last year um, our business is affected by 40 percent worldwide so it's probably 20 percent during the season because we have already sold our equipment uh, to, to to the stores but the, the season next is really a, a total disaster because uh, all dealers are going to tell you we don't want to take any risk. We have inventory. We have, uh, we, you know, we are all set. So it's uh, obviously for the industry, it's uh, it's uh, more and more difficult, uh, and, and everything is happening at this time of the year. If we have snow, as we used to say, uh, to say uh, when we have snow at this time of the year, we are smart. We are smarter than if there is no snow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, good. It's forcing us to rethink our business model, and we're doing it. Uh, first thing we've done, uh, we set as a city council goal the production of a climate resiliency plan, which uh, lays out the program we need to follow to react to the varying degrees that climate change has on our has on our winters. What's happening in Aspen and many other resort communities is that the summers are now as busy if not busier than winters mm. so we become more of this year-round uh, destination location rather than just a winter ski area and that's mm. quite different than the model upon which uh, aspen's roots were founded mm. in, in, okay uh, interestingly um, how important snow is uh, in colorado there's a national football league team the denver broncos when the denver broncos are on national television like on a monday night football and it snows we see reservations climb the next day. That's how important it is to have uh, a lot of snow, at least the perception of it. That's incredible. <laughs> well, uh, around the world, it, it doesn't, um, you know, it, a really interesting thing about this, this mountain world is that it is one of the few pl places where you can see very visible uh, effects of climate change. The, the snow cover and the northern hemisphere is uh, it's it's a giant uh, polygon that kind of stretches out in the winter and shrinks back in the summer, and you can see its extent um, with satellite pictures and whatnot. You can see it with your, you know, with your naked eye when when you're on the Mer de Glace. Uh, I was with a glaciologist on the Mer de Glace, who explained to me it's receded a mile and a half since the industrial age. Um, he has to install rungs on a ladder that goes up to the refuge Rayquan, which is your first uh, stop if you're climbing Mont Blanc. He has to keep putting rungs down on this ladder so you can reach it from the glacier because it's sh it's uh, thinning so quickly. Um, but in that, my, my next question is, is that even given that and this, this very visible change that's so obvious, most of the people I spoke with uh, in the Alps did not believe that humans were connected with climate change. It was a very fascinating, I didn't find this in the Rockies um, when I was researching my book, I didn't find it in any other mountain range, but almost, I'd say 90% of the people from meteorologists to ski area executives to regular old skiers says, no, this is a natural fluctuation. So my question uh, first is for Seth and then, then for Liz, is that taking this empirical evidence that you've gathered 20 years on the tour, you've seen the glaciers shrinking, you've seen events canceled and whatnot, what is what would you tell someone like that? How would you translate that that kind of uh, visual evidence into a testimony for for climate change? And, and Liz, if if you can maybe back that up after with uh, with some of uh, your science stuff. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that uh, I ran into, I, I spent about three and a half years living in Switzerland, and um, a lot of my friends there would often talk about, well, we are still just coming out of the last the last ice age. And so lots of times I think when you look at the historical pictures of glaciers, um, glaciers in Europe where people have kind of a more intimate relationship with glaciers, that they spend time um, on them, around them, doing their activities on them all the time. Uh, I think the Europeans in my um, experience have tended to look at it that way. Whereas um, like for myself growing up in Maine, you know, we can see really visible evidence of the last ice age, um, but glaciers haven't been there for thousands of years, so people don't have an actual intimate relationship with it. Whereas 
for myself, then when I'm talking to groups about it, um, you know, like spending 10 years uh, in Cordova, Alaska, um, participating in filming projects and stuff in the, in the heli ski industry, um, when you see such dramatic change happening there year in and year out, um, I think for those of us that don't grow up around it, it is much more obvious um, that we are at this point of the process where warming is truly happening. And then, um, then when you add, you know, looking at what has actually happened since the industrial age. Um, mm -hmm. One of my good friends who happens to be a, a state senator from Maine, Angus King, um, we were down doing some lobbying in Washington, D.C. about a month ago with the Protect Our Winners group. And when he has to go and talk to the other side of the aisle there, he has these cards that he carries. And it shows roughly these two lines running parallel um, that you know go through warming and cooling patterns. Um, but it is you know, showing the levels of CO2 um, in the air and then showing the temperatures. And then it, and this card that he carries has a, a basically a graph showing the last 100,000 years that as soon as you get to where the industrial age starts and that spike that has now taken us to the over 400 parts, um, it's amazing to just see how quickly we are having an influence on that. And then for me, that's been the really huge thing of you know not growing up around glaciers and spending time on the same glaciers every year and seeing that retreat in a yearly in a yearly fashion is just shocking. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Liz. The scientific lines of evidence are very obvious. We have had natural cycles in the past where you do have advances and you do have retreats, but imprinted upon these natural cycles now is a long-term warming warming trend, and this is due to anthropogenic activities, specifically the accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which trap heat and warm the Earth's surface. So we still will have advances and retreats, but those advances and retreats are going to be trending more towards the end of retreat, and eventually they will be disappearing. This is uh, supported by multiple lines of evidence, not just in glaciers, but in other metrics. So we do see warmer temperatures in other parts of the world. If you were to bury your head in the snow, as it were, and just focus on glaciers in a certain region, you'd really be running a fool's errand here. We really need to consider that other lines of evidence are pointing towards warmer temperatures and there's no sign of reversing. Climate models are the other tool that we use. And when you run a climate model and try to simulate the advance and retreat through using natural cycles alone, you cannot simulate what's going on today. You need to include those anthropogenic activities in the model to see the rate that Seth is um, alluding to. This is a very rapid rate of retreat, and it's not up to, to natural cycles. Thank you. Um, there's a lot of obstacles. That one, one of them that's specific to the, the kind of snow and, and mountain world is um, people's memories. I talked to a guy at uh, SLF, uh, the oldest snow science institute in the world in Davos, Switzerland, um, who said, well, human memory goes back about five years when you think about, uh, was it a good winter or a bad winter? This is a very important question for skiers and snowboarders. It's about what they, they talk about it about half of their life. And they think back like, oh, it was kind of a good year. Oh, you remember 97 with the El Nino. That was an epic year. And over time, as with almost all things with human memory, it starts to get a little bit fuzzy. You don't really see that downward trend. Um, this is, uh, and then you look at SLF's measurements, but they, they're literally measuring them in test tubes since the 18 or early 1900s, and um, that's, that is a very empirical line that you can follow, um, which shows a, you know, a very gradual decline. Um, I was going to ask Mike, uh, what are some other obstacles to um, this, this goal of ours for 100% renewable to, to unify the mountain community voice? What are some political, economic, and even some obstacles here at COP21? Okay, well, I th there are a few obvious obstacles. One is that to really win on climate change, we have to change a lot of stuff. We have to change how we get from place to place. We have to change how we light our buildings, where the power comes from, what kind of food that we eat, where the food comes from, how we protect our forests. We have to change much of how society is currently organized. So one obstacle is that that is hard to do. Um, second obstacle is that the uh, our opponents often are some of the richest, most powerful industries in the history of the world. 
I would say our third obstacle is our largest, which is um, despair and disempowerment. How many folks, when you read or you watch a report on climate change, how many folks come away feeling excited and encouraged and inspired about our ability to solve this challenge? Yeah. Margie? Yes. All right, you got one. After prompting. Um, so, you know, what Ken was saying earlier, he was talking a little bit, Ken Berlin, he was talking a little bit about the changing economics of clean energy. Mm -hmm. So, the, I feel like the, the crazy moment that we're in, if you, you see it on, and you hear it on this panel, um, we can project pretty easily as humans. We're hearing the stories that people are telling, whether they're personal stories or scientific data, and we can see it's gonna get worse in five years. It's gonna get even worse in 10 years. It's gonna get even worse 20 years from now. We know this weather, we're talking about the mountains or the deserts or our forests or extreme weather. But what Ken also talked about was that clean energy is cheap. And increasingly, it's already cheaper than fossil fuels. In most of the US, in more than half of the United States, solar and wind are cheaper than gas, cheaper than coal, cheaper than oil, and cheaper than nuclear power. That's historic, but few people believe it. And few people actually feel that we together are powerful enough to take on the oil industry or the coal industry or the gas industry or all of them together. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, the feeling that we, we are not able to rise up to the challenge, I think is our biggest obstacle. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's one reason why I feel that the, the movement to move cities and corporations and churches and businesses to 100% clean energy is so vital because it shows that not only is fighting climate change an, uh, an obligation, it's an opportunity and we can thrive as a society when we move away from dirty fuels to clean energy. And so when Steve and his city went to 100% clean energy, it gave a lot of people hope. When we get dozens more and dozens more companies to do the same thing, I think it'll give us more confidence to take on some of these challenges. Thanks very much. It's it's um, you know we're we're unique in that snow is our resource. It's um, it's kind of uh, not only waters the mountains and everything downstream and a billion people who depend on snowmelt for their water supply, but it's um, it's it's our resource for the entire sixty five billion dollar uh, snow sports industry in America, um, and and our livelihoods and, and our communities. Um, so, you know, if that is, um, you know, sort of the resource that we're, we're trying to protect, I'd, I'd like to ask Steve and, and Bruno chime in or anyone, um, what, what we have been seeing on this regional level is um, not 100% renewable. What we have been seeing is a tremendous amount of awareness campaigns, of lapel pins, of posters, of um, what I would say at this point is window dressing um, for the real problem. And I just wanted to ask um, if you guys know of any CEOs out there who are, besides uh, Bruno, of course, uh, who are shouting it out from the rooftops and, and what it will take to kind of get through to those people and say um, that this is not only the, the future of the planet, this is also the future of your business. No. <laughs> One, they're calling in already. <laughs> As they do at the Aspen City Council Chamber when I make a statement like this. I'm used to it. Um, uh, One reason I wanted to come and the community supported my coming, the community of Aspen. <laughs> Her interest is from Aspen. <laughs> uh, is, is Aspen attracts uh, a lot of heavy hitters, and many of these corporate executives and people in significant leaders, leadership positions own places in Aspen or come to participate in events. And Aspen can be a lever to push on policy change, uh, which is part of the reason why, as I said, the community um, was supportive of my company, and I want to come represent our interests there here. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to, uh, all, as I said earlier, um, we understand the impacts that our daily habits have and we act in a way to address them. And we hope by 
providing um, the kind of envir stewardship around the environment, we do in Aspen, uh, that tends to inform our local policies, others will follow. Mm. Um, and Aspen, uh, other towns, other uh, resort communities watch what Aspen does. Mm. So we understand how important it is to, to lead and uh, do what we think are the right things. So well, yeah, an, an, an example of what, what can happen is uh, the CEO of Squaw Valley in California, one of the biggest resorts in the country, Andy Worth. And uh, through Andy's own advocacy and, and also working with Protect Our Winter, which is now an advocacy group, uh, Andy writes a, a, an op-ed and, and pushes uh, incredibly aggressively to pass the Clean Power Plan in Nevada and also in California, um, using a, a real treasure, like, like these resorts, these mountain towns, you know, Aspen, Telluride, Chamonix, uh, Truckee, Squaw Valley, they're, they're real treasures to the people that visit um, and, and also to the rest of the country that I, I think everyone knows where Telluride is, you know, or knows where Aspen is. Aspen's a tiny town, you know, it's no offense, but it's like a very, no one knows my little town where I grew up. Um, so, you know, to, to get through to someone like Andy Worth and, and have him push as hard as he has. Um, uh, some executives uh, in, in the National Ski Area Association in, in Utah did the same thing, a historically Republican state, uh, vehemently opposed to the Clean Power Plan. They leaned on the governor very, very hard. And um, that's that's what we're looking for. So, uh, and I'll pass it to, to Bruno to ask, um, maybe in the Alps or, or in the ski industry at large, um, do you see any other uh, CEOs, any other executives jumping on board? No. <laughs> um, I would say, this, you know, this is uh, this is why I'm here. Just to say, enough is enough. I mean, we have more. You need to, to, to be serious about it. Uh, when you are in this wonderful ski business, uh, you don't think about. Uh, probably you don't think about being the one uh, to provide the bad news. Uh, you want to. You want to do your season. You want to attract people. You want to make. Uh, uh, people dream at the beginning of the season about uh, snowy landscapes, fantastic vacations with your family, etc. And, um, and obviously uh, uh, entering into that very serious discussion at that time is the worst time for the industry. So I mean it's because, because it's so easy to switch your mind and to go to the beach instead of in the mountains. Uh, I mean and it's happening sometimes to times. So, so uh, I agree with you. I think we are probably not uh, uh, organized, and, and 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 I do not see a strong willingness to to do so in uh, in 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 the very near future. And I think these uh, occasions like COP twenty one is uh, is really the one we have really to start from there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and Mike, you want to chime in? Yeah. So Porter, uh, Porter. Right. So your your question was um, whether the lapel pins that we wear, bumper stickers, and the window dressing, if that, whether that's enough. Yeah. Which seemed like a setup of a question. Because um, the answer, of course, is of course not. And um, it's it, it should be clear that we are we are in the middle of a, a great adventure to change how our society is powered, right? And that is a fantastic thing to do. And we are, we have adversaries who, as we've talked about, have, are enormously powerful and are contributing to a series of environmental, social, and human rights abuses, some of them, many of them. And so we need, we need people to engage in any way that they're inspired to do so, right? So some folks like SEP have been doing a lot to promote awareness of the issue and going to lobby. Some folks, we have corporate CEOs who are putting their own personal and institutional reputation on the line, uh, standing up for particular policy fights. Some people may want to march or engage in civil disobedience because that's what they're drawn to do, and that's great. Some folks may want to focus more on the solutions, but I think that the message that throughout COP21 is that we need people to engage at a powerful level and to see how they can use every ounce of influence and power that they have as consumers, as investors, as citizens, um, to figure out how do we challenge those who are representing incumbent sources of power, and then how do we inspire others to really go far and be much more ambitious uh, to accelerate this transition that we're already in the middle of. Yeah, that's, that's a great answer. And it's, um, 
definitely something that, that we've been trying to push in the, in the ski industry for, uh, for a while now. Um, well, something that's happening in, in the ski world um, is uh, over the last 50 years ago, uh, there was no such thing as snow making. There was just natural snow and in a bad year, you didn't ski. And then very slowly, this adaptation process started happening kind of unknowingly uh, ski resorts needed to be open for Christmas. Christmas, they make uh, around 30% of their profit um, across the boards from the manufacturing sector to the resort sector. Uh, so they started making snow just to ensure that they could be open for Christmas and then maybe be open for Thanksgiving. Well, at this point, 88% of the resorts um, in uh, North America use snowmaking, about 30% in the Alps uh, use snowmaking uh, as it warms and as that snow line recedes, they're using it more and more and more. Um, so my question is, um, does snowmaking help in this fight to kind of make people aware of climate change and to act and to do the most powerful uh, advocacy they can, or does it kind of turn a, a blind eye towards uh, the fact that it's warming and, and allow people to kind of think, well, it's, you know, it's not that bad, it's man-made snow, it's not natural, but at least I can ski. Uh, Liz, can you respond? So we can make snow at just about any temperature. The question is whether it's going to stay on the ground. And, and one of the issues that we're seeing here is that mi minimum temperatures at night have been warming very rapidly. And the window is closing for where snowmaking can be in a viable strategy for adaptation. And we also run into an issue with snow not being in the metropolitan areas where your skiers are coming from. This is known as the backyard effect, and it's very well documented. If you don't have snow in Boston, if you don't have snow in New York City, they're not as motivated to go out and book a ski vacation or drive up to Maine or fly up to Maine and do some skiing. And this happens to a lot of people. It actually happens to me. If I'm not seeing snow, I, I tend to forget that, I, you know, like, oh, that's an option. I could go skiing. But I, I generally also like the natural stuff quite a bit better. Um, and this is something that's really concerning for places like the Northeast US. They already have 98% snowmaking on the mountains in the Northeast. But temperatures are expected to warm such that places like Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut will have less than a month of natural snow cover by the end of the century. And that's very alarming for states that generally have quite a number of skiers. It's actually more than you would think. Pennsylvania has more skiers than New Hampshire does. It's quite a lot of people, and it's because they're accessible. Those types of resorts that are lower elevation and located near metropolitan areas are serving as feeders to these bigger resorts in Aspen and in California and in northernmost Maine. If you lose those feeder resorts, you're losing a generation of skiers that otherwise might not take up the sport. They might move on to something else like biking, which is doable in those states when you have warmer temperatures. Mm. That's really interesting. One, a, a couple of those uh, tiny resorts have been real leaders in, in this uh, using renewable energy. Um, one in Maine, uh, there's three Mainers on the panel here. Uh, Mount Abram, uh, Berkshire East, um, Jiminy Peak has been doing it for a while. Uh, what, what Mount Abram found was that by installing a, a million dollar solar array, which sounds absolutely insane for a ski hill that has five lifts and 44 trails um, compared to a monolith like Sunny River right down, the, right down the road that's five times bigger. Um, what they realized is that in order for them to be viable and to serve their community, which loves that mountain more than almost anything in the world. If you know, a, you know a Mount A skier, I mean, they got the patches on their jackets and tattoos and they, just, they love it. Um, so they realized that, I don't know, looking 50 years down the road, they weren't gonna be able to afford the amount of snow making that it was gonna take to be open for that Christmas week when they make 30% of their profit. So we were chatting a little bit earlier about kind of using that, that situation uh, to really push this 100% renewable initiative that Iron Pro Snow is launching and to say, you know, from a business perspective, um, this makes more sense for ski areas and ski towns than, than any place in the world right now. Um, I was going to ask Steve, they, they've already gone 100% renewable, if that discussion, if that was part of the discussion or how specific to snow making on the mountain. Yeah, then the viability it does come up in the discussion. The viability of Aspen as a ski resort uh, is part of our 
daily conversation around uh, general public policy. We were joking earlier uh, in these resorts when buildings redevelop, they'll they'll um, keep the sidewalks to melt the snow and ice so people can get to and from their locations. <laughs> but on the mountain, they're making snow. So right across the street, in the United States, there's corporate interests that own the lips and community values that support town vision, and they don't. Uh, they often co conflict. So we're in a good situation, at least. And her a ski company has done remarkable things. And I believe that their lips, the lips running on the mountain, are powered by 100% renewable energy. It's a different energy source that runs them. Mm. It doesn't come. Doesn't come from the Aspen utility, but I believe they have done offsets and. Uh, develop policies too. I was gonna, I was gonna ask Seth, um, and then Mike, um, just along those lines. What, what are the most exciting initiatives that you have seen either this week or, or this year, uh, in terms of uh, pushing renewables, um, fighting climate change advocacy, really, really anything? Well, I mean, I, I think. I would say, unfortunately, at a lot, a number of the ski areas. Um, you know, we've seen an, an awareness be created about what needs to be happening, um, but I think the rollout at a lot of places has been slow. Um, you know, we're actually, we're, we've been training for this last week in Austria. Um, it, it's awesome to see the solar arrays that they have at Pitstall. Um, those were new since we've been there last year. Um, so, and I feel like a lot of times, you know, even though maybe the CEOs or presidents of those ski areas in Europe aren't standing up to say that, yes, this problem's going on. You see them being proactive in what they're doing. Um, you know, I, my home mountain in Maine, I know that what we've been doing since 2007 is investing in snowmaking. Um, and then getting away from the older ways that we did it and creating, um, you know, the new low energy guns, high efficiency. Um, and so they're doing energy savings in that way and trying to offset, but I think um, a lot of times in the state still, we haven't seen um, the full on mind switch to say, hey, we gotta, like Mount Abrams doing, that we need to offset everything that we're doing. Yeah. Uh, so what's exciting? There's a lot to me that's exciting. Aspen going 100% is, is thrilling. Uh, state of California, which is the largest economy, or eighth largest economy in the world, thinks it's the largest economy in the world, um, will be just passed a bill to go to 50% clean energy for the entire state uh, by the end of the next decade. It'll probably exceed that uh, on a shorter timeline. We have seen over the last five years uh, a giant movement in the United States help to secure the retirement of 200 coal plants in the United States, and three quarters of the replacement energy for those coal plants is coming from clean energy. So we're not, largely not replacing coal with natural gas, but we're leapfrogging all the way to clean energy. And I think the thing that's the most exciting is that most of the progress in the United States is actually being made in South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, Nebraska. Omaha, Nebraska will be at 80% clean energy by the end of next year. Omaha, Nebraska, Oklahoma, Texas. So these are states that are the deepest red, some of the most conservative states in the country that are leading the revolution towards clean energy. And so what will happen, I think, as a result of that is that eventually the politics will change. You might not see James Inhofe or other conservative senators linking arms and doing pinky swears with Al Gore, Perhaps, friends <laughs> can. Um, but you are starting to see how conservative Republicans are talking about climate by focusing on clean energy, and that's a huge shift. And it's reflected in the discussion here at COP, because one of the things that will be fought over over the next five, six days is whether there is an explicit agreement on a long term uh, decarbonization goal. So you might see 195 countries agree that by 2050, our entire global economy needs to move to clean energy. That's actually in the running. That's what is being fought over over the next few days. And the fact that that's even on the table and being discussed represents a huge shift. And that's just in the last few years. So we have an enormous amount of momentum. There's a lot to be excited about. The, the challenge, what is terrifying, is whether or not we're doing, making enough progress in enough time. Um, and, and a follow-up to you, because I know you've, you've been in some of these meetings. What are some, this is a, a kind of regional coalition really that we, we have here. What are some success stories from other regional coalitions you've seen, mayors, governors, and whatnot? Sure, so yesterday I spent um, 
two days ago, spent some time uh, at City Hall with uh, hundreds of mayors from all around the world. Um, also have with Margie Alt. Margie is here from Environment America in the United States. Uh, and what we saw actually is this growing movement of what's called subnational uh, premiers, mayors, governors, people who are taking action less at a level less than the national level, but often making a whole lot more progress than is what is able to be made at the national level. So you had a number of mayors who were announcing goals to get to 100% clean energy, a number of mayors announcing really big goals on transportation, um, and a lot of progress being cited, particularly here in Europe, about countries replacing gas and coal uh, with clean energy. Um, and also you're seeing a, a growing movement of what's called the most vulnerable countries, the 20 countries whose existence is threatened, who are calling for 100% clean energy as well. Um, Interesting. Um, it's. I'm sure a lot of these discussions revolve around how we're going to pay for this. Um, and you know, I wonder in, in our world. And, and Bruno, I wonder if you have any insight into this, or, or, or really anyone. The investment required to go 100% renewable. The invest, investment required to become energy independent, so you can make as much snow as you want and uh, still survive as a ski area. Um, do you, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Or? So I, I don't have a solution globally, but in our business, when, when just when we make skis, uh, uh, you, you have plenty of choices. Uh, you can consume a lot of energy or really go in a, in a, in the, in a direction to save as much as you can. So today, uh, in, in some um, products, in some categories, we are we are using more and more uh, recycled materials. We are using more and more um, uh, mineral fibers in term, instead of glass fiber, which is very energy consuming. So, so we go this way. I think it's probably not a solution for, for everything, but each one has, a, has its own uh, uh, solution inside, I would say. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, again, Steve, you went 100% renewable. How much did it cost? How did it happen? Interestingly, we're finding that our rates, electric rates, are among the lowest in Colorado. Mm. After going 100% renewable, we have the seventh lowest rates relative to all the other municipalities throughout the state. And that's after a, a year. You've been we, renewable for about a... Yeah. Well, you know, we're 100% renewable. So you know, we were 93% renewable and 88% yeah. renewable. So we're, we've been charting it. Uh, we didn't... We didn't, uh, yeah, we've been able to maintain some lowest rates. So it's practical, profitable, and the right thing to do. We're finding. Yeah, it's, and, and we were talking about uh, sort of getting some numbers together to, to show uh, other mountain communities and the rest of the ski industry um, how practical it is and how it makes such good business sense. Um, it's, it's fiscally irresponsible for a ski resort executive at this point to not be very up to date on climate change. Right? And what's going on and a lot of them are so have, have you seen now Aspen's 100% do you see uh, Breckenridge and a basin and other people being like oh well you know they, it's like getting a new gondola now everybody's got to get a new gondola is it similar or it's such a good question I, I go to a lot of statewide meetings and I do a lot with the other ski towns in Colorado and at those meetings the conversation usually starts by saying um, oh, we don't want to become Aspen, you know, uh, kind of the glitzy side of, we don't want to be Aspen. And then at some point they, meet and they, they turn to me and say, how did you guys, <laughs> how did you do that green policy? How did you get your mass transit, a rural mass transit system? And so this will be exactly one of those things where we can, again, provide appropriate leadership to all these other communities. And uh, we're happy to share our skill set. Um, there's, um, this is kind of an interest, very specific to, to mountain communities, um, and, and it's tied in with what we've been talking about. The rich and famous live in the mountains. It's, uh, it's just a fact. In America, uh, certainly in the Alps, um, it, has there been any discussion about the fact that um, these kind of enclaves, this incredibly large real estate business that, that, that has erupted in the mountains is very much at risk? Um, and using that as a lever, again, to, to push some of these influential folks to, to get on board. You mean if they don't pursue this kind of action, will undermine their property value? They're going to lose their ski house, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, quite frankly,
frankly, that's I can't say that that's a discussion that comes to the comes to the city council table. Yeah, it's it's something that that we'll be reporting on a little bit. Um, it's something that drives uh, the mountain um, community economy, and um, it's it's definitely a big big piece of the puzzle. Yeah, you know when the Great Recession hit the United States a few years back, property values in Aspen dropped about 30%. That's what it took. Yeah. So until, as we said earlier, until there's, well, Teton, you feel the pain. Teton Valley in Idaho dropped about 50%. I mean, this is, you know, this is hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Very, very relevant. Um, so, so we're at COP21. Um, I, I'd like to ask uh, maybe Liz and, and Mike, um, you know what? What kind of an agreement are you hoping uh, that we'll walk away from from this conference with? Well, I'm hoping to see really large reductions in greenhouse gas emissions globally. I mean, the the target that people talk about is the two degree mark, but really 1.5 would probably be a lot better. Um, zero would be very ideal. Uh, it's probably unrealistic though, because and there's a reason for that, and it's because there's already there's already heat coming through the pipeline. We can't stop this train with just one brake stop. It's it's already accumulating atmosphere. If we reduce emissions, that doesn't reduce concentrations in the atmosphere. Concentrations continue to rise. They just rise at a slower rate. And that's what's really important here is that we need to reduce and we need to set our goals even past 2100 to reducing to zero because the carbon needs to come out of the atmosphere. We can't just reduce what's going in. Yeah, I would agree. Uh, so the official goal for the, the COP process is two degrees, but there's certainly a lot of movement to move it back to 1.5, which as Elizabeth said is 1.5 too many. Uh, we're already at about one and we're seeing the effects right now. So um, there is a chance to get somewhat more formal language around 1.5, which is certainly a, a top goal of, of COP. Um, there also is a, a fight to be had, as I mentioned before, about a long-term, uh, somewhat long-term, 2050 goal to uh, for a full decarbonization of the economy. So the language around that is important. Here's what's here. What we know is going to happen is that there will be, if there's an agreement, um, and there's a decent chance that there will be one, it's likely that the agreement will be both historic and insufficient at the same time. It'll be historic because you have everybody participating, or almost everybody, 180 plus countries. You will see the curve begin to bend down. You'll see uh, significant greenhouse gas reductions from countries all around the world, uh, many of whom had never made pledges before. Uh, and at the same time, even if every single one of those agreements are implemented, it won't get us to even two degrees, much less beyond that. So part of the other things that we're fighting for over the next few days are um, a mechanism to increase the level of ambition over subsequent years so that we can come back and take another crack at this in 2018, 2020, 2025, uh, as clean energy becomes even cheaper, as the consequences of climate change become even more clear and more severe, uh, we should have an opportunity to reopen the agreement. And then there's a bunch of other things um, regarding whether or not there will be just transition mechanisms to make sure that the jobs of workers uh, who are currently based in the fossil fuel industry will be taken care of, whether the pledges uh, are transparent and countries' progress towards meeting those pledges are transparent, or whether we'll be completely in the dark and relying on India or China or the United States for that matter, um, just reporting their own progress or lack thereof. Um, and then in particular also whether or not there's a human rights uh, and indigenous rights component in this as well, uh, because there are communities who are suffering on a daily basis because of extraction for fossil fuels, and we need to find a way to address the social and human components of this as well. That's great, thanks. Um, we've got a few minutes left. I know we have one question, and uh, maybe uh, maybe a few others, but we'll start right back here in the white. My name is Katie Christensen, and I've been working on climate energy for about 25 years in Tomasun Valley, Idaho, about six years ago. Hi, Steve. Um, and Sun Valley's owned by a family that owns Sinclair Oil, so you can imagine our conversations are a bit difficult on these issues, but what's working, and I thought I wanted to share with you guys, and I'm curious about your response, is um, of course the financial bottom line, so anything where I can show that makes sense, but also marketing. So we're an aging population, we're through the oldest first destination ski resort in the United States, and so 
a lot of people are concerned we become like a retirement community and it's very aging. And so what we're finding is the marketing of leadership on renewable energy, on energy efficiency, of walking the walk, is really helping them understand this is where their customers are coming from, San Francisco, New York, Seattle, et cetera, and they have expectations, and the young people just expect to see it. So I was just kind of curious from Aspen's perspective and others, um, do you see a marketing piece to this, and how effective is it for some of these resorts and the companies who work in the industry? Thanks. Yeah. Marketing related, marketing specific to what? The, marketing, uh, the fact that you're leading on green issues, do yeah. you find that that helps with your customer base? Is there an expectation on that front? Uh, I don't know that it helps with the customer base, and probably not with the senior generation. But I think it will become an expectation, and it will be part of everything we do in the future. And I was going to agree on, on the manufacturing side of things. Does it does it matter to put that emblem on your skis? Or yes, but you have to you have to make sure you convince people in in participating into it and doing something. You know, obviously we are all concerned and and. Uh, and we are all willing to, 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 to find solutions, but you cannot just be happy just in saying that. I mean, it doesn't work. I mean, it's, uh, people want you to be, to be part of it, and this is why we have developed specific programs on, on, on green products, etc., etc. But it's, um, especially I can tell you on the ski category a product, it's not an easy one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but, but we are really working at it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, next question. Oh, right here. Thanks, Porter. Uh, Paul Thompson with Cool Planet Skiers uh, from Minnesota. Uh, and just to put in a word for Nordic skiing, making snow for a mountain is much easier than 55 kilometers for the Birkebeiner Trail. So the Nordic ski uh, industry and skiers are very concerned about what, what's happening. Uh, my question is, in the agreement for Elizabeth and Michael, uh, drawing down carbon through proper land management and agriculture and the way we, you know, grow things and let things grow. Is there anything, any possibility that that's going to be embedded in the agreement so we can begin to draw carbon out of the atmosphere without relying on geoengineering? Uh, I'll take a little bit of that. Uh, there's some language around there more focused on forests than on uh, agriculture and land use. Um, farming perspective. And I think that this is the, it's one of the more undeveloped pieces, both in the UN uh, FCCC uh, process, the, the actual negotiations, but also the broader topic and the debate, um, certainly in the, in the United States, but really in the environmental movement globally, most of the focus has been on the energy side and a lot less on both food and forests. And it's the land management side, food and forests, that are key, both because they're great contributors to climate change, and as you cite, it's one of the few areas where we can actually make great progress and begin to get back down to zero and go from 400 back down towards 350. So short answer is no, it's not in there. The longer answer is that I think that there's a growing awareness and, a, and an acute need to have more attention um, on those areas. I can add something to that. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. So from a scientific perspective, um, one of the issues I think in including this in COP is that there is a lot of uncertainty in how much carbon these forests are capable of drawing out of the atmosphere. And also the fact that if there wasn't a forest there to begin to, if we're talking about reforestation as opposed to afforestation, where you're putting forests where there never was one, you're simply removing carbon from the atmosphere that was initially put in when you removed the forest in the first place. Um, so there, there's kind of a bit of an accounting issue there in terms of what carbon you're actually taking out of the atmosphere. And the also, the, the another issue is just in terms of using climate models to do this. Are they up for the task in terms of making sure that this calculation is correct and that we're actually doing what we think we're doing? There are a lot of uncertainties with nutrient availability, um, feedbacks in the carbon cycle in terms of um, what they call a, a carbon assimilation, a temperature acclimation. How do these plants acclimate to a warming climate? Do they start sequestering more carbon? Um, so there's still a lot of uncertainty about that. Mm -hmm. uh, over here. Thanks. I thought that was a great session. Very, very interesting. One thing that I, I noticed uh, from the group is that there was a lot of talk about rich people, uh, but there wasn't any talk about poor people. Uh, I think where I'm from, a lot of people are excited so I wonder 
what you were messaging would be to to rural communities, uh, particularly in the north, who maybe who maybe don't understand uh, the scientific angle, uh, and how you would message to them. Uh, how it works in this um, I'll I'll start with that and then and then pass it on to someone. Um, a big part of I am pro snow, protect our winters, snow riders are national is to is the message that we're not really just talking about skiing here. We're talking about snow as an essential element of the water cycle on the planet and also the climate cycle on the planet. Um, the snow coverage in Siberia with 75% accuracy could tell you uh, whether it's going to be an extremely cold winter in New England or a mild winter in New England. Um, if there is a, a lack of sea ice in the Barents Sea, um, it can create a, a, a situation where Europe goes into a deep freeze and gets an incredible amount of snow. Um, it's, as you hear again and again, everything is interconnected. Snow itself is, is a massive uh, element in that, in that world. Um, I said before, a billion people depend on snow melt for their water supply. So you can tell people in rural communities who, who really are a big part of this. Uh, the reality is, is that we're talking, we were talking about people that have a lot of leverage, more leverage than us. Find your biggest lever and push it. Well, that's them. The people that really deal with these issues um, are much less wealthy. Um, and the, the towns that I was in, in Peru and Bolivia and in Morocco and around the world, um, were incredibly poor and were very much affected. Um, so what you would tell them is, is look at their uh, rivers that are coming out of the snowpack, look at where that snow is melting and going. Uh, the farmlands, the uh, hydroelectric power in Nepal was 98% hydro before the earthquake. Well, if those glaciers melt out and there is no more water coming out of the Himalaya, um, there's going to be billions of people without power, without water, without uh, the ability to grow food. Um, so that's, that's really how, how it affects them. Um, does, does anyone on the panel want to add? And Liz, I know you've dealt with kind of the, the element of snow outside of the fact that you know, we like to ski on it. Right, so, so snow provides some very important climate regulation properties. And Seth had alluded to this with the blankets that they're putting over the glacier. Those blankets are white for a reason, and it's because it reflects the sun's energy. Snow does the same exact thing. When you remove snowpack, you're exposing a much darker ground surface. This absorbs more of the sun's energy and helps to heat the surface. And it creates a very strong, what they call positive feedback loop, where it's just self-enhancing and the warming accelerates. The, the consequences of this is that the wet get wetter and the dry get drier. So even if you're not seeing, you know, you're like, oh, I don't have to shovel anymore, or oh, it's great, I don't slip on the sidewalk, or I don't have to heat my home as much. There's other consequences, such as more drought in areas that are already prone to drought. And there's also issues with flooding in areas that are already prone to have rains. So that would be another take on that. Yeah, and it's it sounds um, kind of revelatory to people that, that haven't thought about it that much. It also might sound like, like kind of a, a small issue in climate change. Well, consider the fact that um, there's a million square miles less uh, spring snowpack. It has shrunk by a million square miles in the northern hemisphere. That's in the last 50 years. A million square miles of reflective snow is gone. Um, when the sea ice melts, it, uh, the dark ocean absorbs that heat. It's, it's, a, it is a, it's a real thing, and it's a, a big reason why we're, we're passionately advocating for keeping the, the planet cool. Uh, yeah, right here. I actually kind of have the same question, and with respect, I feel like it wasn't a satisfactory answer. And I feel like there is realm, then you're missing the opportunity to say influence voters for the next presidential election. So I'm wondering, one, is I Am Pro Snow doing anything to engage people beyond just the elite influencers? And, and two, if not, what are some ways that you could be doing that? And I think Michael Brune might have a response to how to engage people who are beyond just the sort of wealthy affluent side. Mm. <laughs> um, well, I don't have a response for I Am Pro Snow, but something else. Well, I, I mean, one thing that I, I, where I grew up and where I live in uh, in rural Maine, it's a it's a poor area. Um, Franklin County is one of the, the poorest counties in the state. Um, even just looking at it as a mechanism for employment, um, you know, Sugarloaf and Sunday River, the two biggest ski areas in the state, are the two biggest half of the year wintertime employers, um, and most of those 
jobs are true, you know, they're barely above poverty level working jobs. I mean, literally for, you know, 20 year olds going out and making snow for $10 an hour or the part of the shuttle bus drivers or whatever. But it, it is this huge mechanism that for a lot of the poor communities and areas, I mean, we draw from about a 100 mile radius of people that come to work those labor jobs for those six months of the year that the mountain's operating. And, and in that way, it is providing you know, a positive feedback loop to that community that while snow is on the ground, there is employment for those people in the poorer communities. So what I wanted to say is that um, according to the World Health Organization, there are more than 300,000 people every year who die because of air pollution. In the United States, there's 10,000 people every year who die just from the soot, the particulate matter coming from coal plants. Um, most of those people are living within 30 miles of a coal plant, and those are almost always located in low-income communities, communities of color. We know that climate change, if you look at UN IPCC documents, climate change will create up to 250 million refugees over the coming decades. These, are, these will be refugees not coming from Aspen or Squaw Valley, but they'll be coming from countries who are already suffering uh, because of droughts or wildfires, or whatever it might be. So I, I, I do think it's, it's, in, it's incumbent upon, whether it's the environmental movement or policymakers or corporate leaders or any kind of coalition effort that we put together, it's incumbent that we build an alliance of uh, perhaps policy elites, low-income communities, immigrant rights organizations, labor organizations, um, to, to show how we need to make this transition. We need to accelerate the rate of the transition, but as we're doing so, we have to first look at those communities who are most impacted uh, from fossil fuel extraction, uh, or who live near fossil fuel refineries or coal plants, and make sure that the workers in those industries are carried forward in this transition so that their employment can be secured and they can see themselves in a clean energy future. Um, and it's critical because what, as we're negotiating, whether it's a, a bill passing through Congress or whether it's something you know, in, in a parliament in any other country or at the UN, if we're simply talking at an abstract intellectual level, whether it's two degrees or 1.5 and what the transparency levels are, we won't be able to uh, build the political power necessary to actually make this transition. Uh, so from a strategic but also a moral perspective, making sure that we're speaking with, not to, but with, low-income communities is imperative uh, and critical to our success. You know, I just want to add something for the Climate Reality Project and Pro Snow. Of course, I 100% agree with Mike just said. We are all working at all levels in society to try and bring this about. We're all going to be working together, Sierra Club, us, all the U.S. environmental groups to build public support for this at a voting level in the United States, to build support really around the world to address this issue. This is profoundly not an issue of the wealthy. This is an issue of everyone in society, particularly the poor. We all recognize that. We're all going to work to, to try and make sure that people are protected at every level. Uh, we use every mechanism we can. We'll reach out to every community can, as, as we are in Pro so. But it's an issue that really affects everyone, and we should all look at it that way. And, you know, there is no hiding from it. I mean, if things were a little bit warmer in some places, doesn't mean they'll benefit. I mean, there are all kinds of consequences that we talked about from weather and stuff like that that will affect everyone even you know in a slightly warmer world too so this is an issue that affects us all and that's how we look at it thank you thanks again for uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, thanks for the question it's exactly the right thing to ask uh, and i have this conversation inside the city with our staff and i and i say that um you know, we have the means to get to get this stuff done we put in storm really non-sexy projects like storm water treatment to protect our river from all the runoff uh, and then we'll uh, we invest in it, we get it done, and then we'll be awarded for it, and we have we'll party and we celebrate ourselves. And I and I say I think we should stand for something more than cel just celebrating our success. And everything we do, and I'm pushing our staff. Everything I everything we do, I believe everything we do should be scalable and replicable, so we can hand it off to the next community. And we happen to sit at the end of a, of a valley. There's a lot of communities leading up to us, um, who who can follow our leadership or or. or uh, benefit from our toolkit and one thing we're doing is working our staff is working with the local uh, utility co-op holy cross whose portfolio i think is around 10 percent renewable uh, in helping them get to a, a more significant level of using renewables 
Um, so we're out of time. I just want to say thanks to everybody for showing up. There's uh, there was a letter on your seat. Um, more than a thousand folks around the world, um, in the mountains and in the cities, have uh, signed this letter asking for strong action at COP21. You can also go to improsnow.org forward slash letter and sign it. Um, it would uh, really help with this, uh, this push that we're trying to make. So thanks to the panelists so much for being here. And, uh